Hello, this is Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to worship with us, either online or in person at 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday. And to join us in this Bible study, we welcome you. We welcome you because we are studying an important topic, and it seems it seems sad to call it a topic. Uh, this is what we're doing. We're looking at the person and work of Jesus Christ. And many of you know and often recite the Apostles' Creed. Some people recite it as part of their morning devotion. In others, it only happens when they are in worship services and it's printed in the bulletin or up there on the screen. I believe in Jesus. Millions and millions of people throughout the world believe in Jesus, hundreds of millions of people. And many of them know this creed by heart in their own language as it has been translated in hundreds, maybe thousands of languages throughout the world. It's an amazing thing that the church for, oh, let's say seven from 20, for at least 13 centuries has been confessing, I believe in Jesus Christ who is God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived and born and suffered, died, was buried, descended. And this is the way we did it last week. This is what we believe about Jesus Christ as we confess it in the creed. What we believe about Jesus. There are, there are other creeds beside the Apostles' Creed. Some of you know the Nicene Creed. Very few Christians would be able to recite the third popular creed because it isn't that popular, and that is called the Athanasian Creed. And there's a long, long story that we won't get into today no. about the Athanasian Creed, yeah. but what yeah. we believe yeah. um, about Jesus Christ uh, yeah. Yeah. is recorded. If you have talking in the background, it would be really helpful. If you would, uh, if you would mute that, uh, there we go. Okay. So we believe about Jesus, that he is the Christ. And we went through these last time, God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And these yeah. are the phrases, the phrases that confess what we believe about Jesus. Crucified, died, was buried. But it the story didn't end there. After his resurrection, he descended into hell to proclaim victory. As the first letter of Peter declares, he rose again from the dead and appeared to many over a period of 40 days. Uh, appeared at one time, says St. Paul, to over 500. and They are witnesses of the resurrection. He ascended into heaven on that glorious day recorded in Acts chapter 1, and now look at him, sits at the right hand of God, which is not a place, I hasten to add, not a place, but the, the receiver again of what he had before he left heaven and became incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. That's the Nicene Creed, the creed phraseology. He has all the power and the glory. And now we have this mystery of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit confessed in the creed. And he's going to come. That's the last chapter in the history of this world as we know it, when he comes to judge the living and the dead, or as we used to say uh, up until about 30 years ago, the quick and the dead. <laughs> The children always want to know who the quick were. <laughs> uh, catechism stories. You remember reciting this when you were a child? Anybody? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did you, learned, have to <clears throat> you had to memorize it? We spent one year on that in catechism. A whole year on the creed. That's yes. great. That's great. Well, this is what we believe about Jesus. And all I have done is take out the middle of the creed and give it to you here. Not the first article, God the Father, and not the third article, God the Holy Spirit. 
and his work. So we're just studying Jesus. What we believe about Jesus is summarized in the second article of the creed. Everybody has that. This is actually a review of what we did last time. You will remember, okay? Any questions about any of these? Well, if you ask me questions about each one of them, each one of them could be a whole lesson. And when you were 12, 13, 14 years old, you did spend um, one week on each of these parts. If you had a, a very thorough pastor teaching you, the Apostles' Creed. We confess, as we said last time in the Apostles' Creed, what we believe about Jesus. And the source of those teachings was what? What was the source of the Apostles' Creed? Apostles. Uh, indirectly, Bible. yes. Bible. The, the Bible. Bible, yes. Bible. And Luther's Catechism. Well, uh, before that, there was the scriptures. Yeah, and was. Luther confesses in the catechism what is in the scriptures. Otherwise, we have some work to do. Matthew, right. Mark, and Luke primarily? Um, I'm going to say primarily the gospels, but then we have St. Paul. The apostle has a lot to say about Jesus the Christ, and we're going to see some of that this time. Last time you asked me a question about when was the Apostles' Creed composed, and actually it was a gradual process over a period of four centuries. The earliest writing um, of it that is a precursor to the Creed happens in the last decade of the fourth century, and you know how we count. The fourth century is the, the years 301 through 399 or 400, correctly. That's the way we count the centuries. So somewhere around 390, isn't that easy to say? Mm -hmm. uh, the first very small beginnings of the Apostles' Creed were written down, and that was found in an ancient letter that someone discovered I love the people who go sifting through the, the sands and the rocks of, and, the, and the ruins and come up with manuscripts. And somewhere in the seventh century, the 600s, uh, they have found the complete with minor variations in the Apostles' Creed. The only reason we confess the Apostles' Creed today is that we find it that it does confess the truths of the scriptures. If it didn't, we'd have to fix the creed. You understand, mm -hmm. the creed is not the source of our beliefs, but the statement of what we believe on the basis of the scriptures. And it's a summary. It doesn't tell the whole story. The content of our faith comes from the scriptures, as I just said. So then they wrote it down, and they wrote it down so that if anyone believed something contrary to the creed, or preached it, or taught it, or wrote it, that they could be corrected on the basis of the creed, which was a statement of what the scriptures taught. If the creeds were inaccurate, then they would have been corrected by those early teachers you understand it was a, a self-correcting kind of thing. And when there were people who taught otherwise, they were corrected. And sometimes great and long meetings of many, many church leaders and theologians gathered together and, and pointed to the person or the teaching and said, that's not right. Hmm. The, the people who believed in truth were strong and mighty. And uh, we, we thank God for them. Now, that's too long of a story for our purpose, which is to study Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that was Peter's confession. And in a way, that is a creed. When Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that statement, that quote, 
is a creed because that's what Peter believed. Now I brought this up last time and I wanted to emphasize it again in case, well, I'm not always clear when I speak off the cuff, that is uh, extemporaneously. So I wrote it down. The creed comes from the Latin. And anybody remember the Latin word? Credo. Yes. I pronounce it credo, but I could be wrong. I last took Latin in 1956. <laughs> I've lost a lot of gray matter since then. But this word means, I believe. And if you read the Apostles' Creed in Latin, and it was written in Latin, you would find that the first word was credo. So what is it that you believe? If someone asks you, what do you believe about God? Uh, that he's invisible and he's powerful and he, he is, what do you believe about Jesus? I believe that he is the son of God. You see how you would go about using the creed as a summary of what you believed. So I can give you that summary by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I could also give you a summary by reciting the Nicene Creed. Now, did I ever tell you this story? <laughs> this is a tangent. <laughs> I am announcing a tangent, but okay. a purposeful one. And it's, it's a joke on pastors. It's a, it's a realization that we aren't perfect and we don't know everything and we forget a lot of things. A long, a long time ago, like three decades ago, when the pastor got up to the altar and recited with the congregation the Nicene Creed, he wanted to be accurate. And so rather than recite it from memory, a lot of pastors were reading it from the book from the hymnal, right? Okay. They were. I was. Mm -hmm. So the short story goes this way, that we had a retreat of pastors in our circuit, and uh -huh. about 15 of us gathered around a campfire, and we had a worship service. It was really beautiful until we came to the part where it said in the leaflet that we passed out that we would recite the Nicene Creed. <laughs> and oh, no. you know what's coming next yep, nobody knew it <laughs> we knew parts of it and we stumbled along and finally oh. someone said under their breath you know there was nobody else but us pastors let's recite the apostles creed <laughs> <laughs> because nobody could go through the and there were some in, including Pastor Phipps. There were some aged pastors there. Uh, he was at least in his 50s then, who also could not recite it from memory, even though they probably had to do so when they were 13 or 14 years old. I'm going to pause. Did any of you memorize the Nicene Creed in catechism? No, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember either. I'm pretty sure that we didn't. Um, maybe Pastor Clem could have recited it back in, in his day. I'm not going to ask him to embarrass himself this morning. So what if we didn't have a creed? Would it be okay? Is there, is there a... Yes. Yes, you're correct. We're with you, Pastor. Yes. Just want to say good morning. Well, good morning to you. Yes. Uh, do you uh, do you think we could live if in the church if we didn't have a creed? I am sure we could. We could, and yes. in fact, the, the early church did exist without a creed for two or three or four centuries, and they didn't always use it in their worship service. You see, our worship service, though it comes and has sources deep in the, the Jewish practices of worship has also changed over the centuries and will continue to change. 
and that will disturb a lot of people. But I'm not going to bring that subject up today. <laughs> no, no, we don't do worship wars here. So if we didn't have a creed, what happens? Well, then we could go to 1 Timothy 3.16. Right. 1 Timothy 3.16. What does that say? Would someone uh, recite that? Judy, you're always Timothy. the first reader. I'll ask you. Okay. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, taken up in glory. All right. It sounds like you ended expecting more, didn't it? I'm sorry. We didn't have a creed. We could confess. Now, the bullets aren't in the original. I divided up this text from one verse in the Bible to something that St. Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy didn't write 1 Timothy. Paul wrote three letters, two to Timothy and one to Titus, about how they should do uh, what they would believe and teach and how they would conduct the church in their area. That was the subject of those two pastoral letters from a missionary, St. Paul, to two pastors, one named Timothy, his son in the faith, and uh, Titus. Well, I'm not going to go into their location or their churches, but here a type of confession, and if you will look at it with me, it is a type of a creed. Mm -hmm. And the mystery of godliness is a great thing. And we confess that it is truly great, and that it's a mystery. And it, it's a mystery. Well, what's a mystery? What is a mystery? Something we can't explain? Yes. I, well, you've, you've read mysteries, haven't you? Yeah. Or you've seen them. In a, or we can't figure it out? There's something that's not completely revealed until it is revealed. And what happens is the author or the playwright gives you clues along the way. And eventually, mm -hmm. in, in the last few pages of the mystery, you find out who done it. Um, and what they did and how they accomplished it and all of those details. But as you go along, you don't know the mystery. And this is what God did. As you know, throughout the pages of the Old Testament, God began to reveal more and more about his salvation, which we know has been accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ. But it wasn't always fully known. By the time that St. Paul writes this, he is speaking of certain parts of the mystery, and they are six in number. I could have numbered those, huh? And it's speaking about the mystery of godliness. Now, the word godliness is a, is a word that I have trouble fitting into my little mind. Maybe you do, too. Um, hmm. Your godliness and my godliness is, is our relationship to the true God. Right. And that relationship is a bit of a mystery. You can't explain it to me. You would say, well, I, I just believe. Yes, but how did that come to happen? Well, that is kind of a mystery, isn't it? And there's a mystery of the godliness that has been given to us in the person of Jesus. Now, Look what Paul says is true about Jesus Christ. He was manifested. That's a big word. He was shown. He was revealed. He was declared in the flesh. Well, what is today? The fifth? Uh, yes. Well, there's 20 more days, and we'll celebrate this manifestation of Jesus Christ, who is eternal with the Father. Jesus Christ had a beginning only insofar as his coming to be in the flesh. 
-hmm. And that happened uh, nine months before the birth of Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit came and that mysterious, unexplained mystery of Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit. Don't ask anybody to ever explain that. Nobody is ever <laughs> going to be able. God doesn't explain it to us. Right. But he doesn't have a human father. He was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. Right. And nine months later, there was a, a revealing of the Son of God when Mary gave birth. He was in the flesh. He was a, a real living human being. I don't know how long or tall he was. I, I don't know how many pounds he weighed. It doesn't, that wasn't recorded. He didn't have a little halo around his head like the artists show. Mm. Mary knew. And so did Joseph. And <laughs> there's so much you could say about it. This next sentence, the next phrase, I'm sorry, uh, vindicated by the Spirit. The word vindicated is based on a word that means he was justified. He was shown to be true uh, without any error, without any sin, by the Spirit. There's some discussion as to whether that is his Spirit or the Holy Spirit. I can't... Uh, there, there are divisions among those who study this. So he was shown to be righteous. That's the important word. Uh, by the Spirit. And then, look at him. He was seen by the angels. Jesus was seen by the angels. And there's something about Jesus in his life that when something important is going to happen in his life, you'll find the angels around. Now, what are the three main times in the life of Jesus when you have the angels present and declaring something. Well, before he was born, he right. to Mary. What we sometimes call the Annunciation. Right. When an, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her this fantastic story. They also came to Joseph and spoke to him. That's right. Um, that of what, of what was going to be happening to Mary. That was good, that they both got the same story from the same yeah. angel. And then what's the next time the angels appear? When he's born. When he is right. born. Yeah. They announce it to the yeah. shepherds. So we have, we have witnesses, and that's very important. The historicity, the historicity of Jesus Christ, that there is, it's more than a story. It's a history of a real man who was born for real people like us, who were sinners in need of salvation. So here he is, seen by the angels. And what's the third time? That the angels are present at a very important event. Oh, when he ascended? Well, when he, when he arose out of the grave, they sat on the tomb. That's right. They were present to guide the women who came early to the tomb, and yeah. they were told he is not here. He is risen as he said. The angels, the word angel, I think you know, means what? Messenger. Messenger. And here they are in these three places proclaiming what God, how else is God going to proclaim this? Is it, he doesn't have sky riders. He, he can't take out uh, something on Facebook in, in those days. <laughs> what if God had a Facebook? Oh, he does. The Holy Scriptures, Genesis to Revelation. Pastor, did an angel come to Joseph and tell him to take the baby out of Bethlehem? Uh, yes. So the king would, uh, uh, is it, is it, king would be I'm going to have to look that up because I don't remember. It says angel then or was revealed to him in a dream. 
and it might have been a dream that said take take the baby oh, was and, a dream. and flee yes you remember correctly uh mm -hmm. but i can't remember that it was an angel i think it was uh, look that up in um, matthew chapter chapter one or two chapter one the, the, the birth of jesus christ took place on this wise that's, that's the king james translation and then it tells the story matthew tells the story so let's go on he was seen by the angels uh finally you said correctly the third time was at his resurrection and then the next thing that happens according to his command Jesus Christ was proclaimed among the nations. <laughs> Go ye therefore and make disciples of all mm. nations. Right. Baptizing and then teaching. And that's what happened. He was proclaimed among the nations, ta ethne, to all of the nations of the world. And that's still happening. But Paul is writing in the first century when he is saying as an historical fact that Jesus Christ was proclaimed. And Paul is witness to the fact that these people in the nations, including the, the nation of what we call Asia Minor, or it's Turkey now, and those cities up there, Ephesus and in Galatia, and so forth. And he was believed on in the world. And it's true. Mm. The story spread. And then, when was he taken up in glory? What's that? When was mm. Jesus taken up in glory? You know. Transfiguration. Pardon? In the trans transfiguration, he was taken up in glory. Uh, you need to go further on in history than that. Ascension? The ascension, he was taken up in glory. And the angel said, Why stand ye looking up into heaven? He will come in the same way as you saw him go. Mm -hmm. so the difference between ascension and transfiguration is. The transfiguration was revealed to Peter, James, and John on the high and holy mountain in the presence of Moses and Elijah, and they were talking with him, and Peter had this grand suggestion, that's going to put up booths so we can stay here a while. Peter, what am I going to do with you? Well, it isn't recorded that Jesus said that to him, or even that he sighed, but they went down from the mountain and then continued the education you could say the catechism of the apostles. They had a lot to learn. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had, a, and then they were going to have a lot to tell. So I've taken a lot of time on 1 Timothy 3.16 to show you that creeds were, well, this creed was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that Paul wrote it down. But when was it composed? Well, some people believe on the basis of the structure of the Greek that it was an early Christian hymn. Can't prove that. There's no music. There's no hymn book, certainly. But that it was either a hymn or a psalm that was said in worship about this Jesus that we confess is a mystery that has been revealed to us but not explained. Oh. That would a, a hymn a hymn would have made easy sense to, to uh, I guess back in those days when you think of the media they have um, to sing a hymn and remember it through singing a hymn. Exactly. Uh, because um, many of people didn't read, so or they didn't have necessarily written word for everybody. But it could be memorized. But it could be memorized as a hymn. Yeah. When, one generally remembers a song easier than just a plain verse. I think you know, I'll have to scratch your gray matter a little bit to do this, that our Apostles' Creed has been put in hymn form. 
I'm not going to try to sing. We all believe in one true God. That's the title of a hymn. Mm -hmm. if, if I were in the room upstairs with you, I'd grab a hymn book and we'd all look it up together. But I'm not, I can't do that here with this uh, PowerPoint. The Nicene Creed is also a hymn. What is that? The Nicene Creed is also in yes. hymn form. Yes, it is. And it becomes a paraphrase because you can't, I suppose you could, but it, it isn't word for word. Probably not. It's paraphrased. All right. So here's another hymn. Well, when the people read this in the original Greek and look at the structure, they believe that what is said here about Jesus who took the form of a servant, follow my bouncing ball here. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. This is about Jesus, you see, about Christ. Mm -hmm. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. How obedient was he? To the point of death, even death on a cross. Mm -hmm. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. I think you know this. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's your confession. To the glory of God the Father. Believe that this is what you believe. And if you didn't have a creed, you'd have Philippians 2. And Paul uses this as a, an example of how you should behave in the Christian church, that you should have the humility of Jesus and the obedience of Jesus, though you're never, never, ever going to be exalted as he was. Oh, that could never be. But that you would be his servant and the servant of one another, and a servant of the church in all that you do. This is a tremendous confession. I don't think when you read Philippians cover to cover, the five chapters, four chapters, four. Philippians, yes, uh, that you would uh, see this if I didn't pluck it out here and give it to you as mm -hmm. a confession of what you believe about Jesus. Comments, questions, pauses. <laughs> I'm taking some time here because it's not often covered. It's too complex to cover in a sermon. Many things can be better covered in a Bible study than yeah. in 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. I think you understand that. If no questions or comments, I'll push the button and talk about a wonderful thing that some of you memorized when you were a teenager, maybe, maybe sooner than that. I love this. Now, people who study literature believe that this is one of the most beautiful, well-constructed sentences that ever uh, came uh, from, from a human being. Because it is a summary of what we believe about Jesus. I have personally uh, an, an emotional connection with this sentence. Now, I found out with you a few weeks ago that we could not in, or I don't know how to do it. Maybe you can. How do we recite it together in unison when Zoom is constructed for one speaker at a time? Yeah. If you find out, let me know and I'll do it with you. But 
I want someone to read it who is, do you recognize this? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Do you recognize that? Yes. Has it been years and years and years since you read it? It's been a while. Yes. That exact sentence. Well, who volunteers to read it? I'll, I'll volunteer. Or, Bobby, go ahead. I had to say this as part of my confirmation process uh, at Trinity uh, almost 40 years ago. Well, you know, you're closer to it than any of us. That's right. <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe Joanne, I don't want to leave you out because I don't know ages, but I know that Bobby is probably the youngest one amongst us. Go ahead, Bobby. Probably I right. believe. And if I get interrupted, I'll, I'll have to go. But I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begun in the Father from eternity and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with his silver or gold, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be in his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns for all eternity. Thank you, Bobby. Good this job. is most certainly true. I remember. Oh, we you, were yeah. <laughs> you caught me. I left that out. Yes. All right. Now, if you study this, and I commend this to you, and you'll get it, because I'm going to, as I've been doing, mail the slide texts to you today or tomorrow. Um, this is Martin Luther's explanation to the second article of the creed. And if you study it, you realize it's not as much about his, the facts of his life, his conception, his life, his death, resurrection it's it's in there but it is the relationship that god has created when he brought us to faith in jesus so that we believe not only that jesus christ is true god and true man but what did he do he redeemed me mm -hmm. he purchased me he won me from what from death yeah eternal death and from the power of the devil. Amen. What did he pay? No, uh, the ransom price was much greater than blood. Silver, than blood. Holy, precious blood. It's innocent. Why, why did he do that? A great purpose. People looking for purpose in their life and writing great books that sell millions of copies. This is all you need. This is your only purpose. He did it because of his love for us and for um, and and his obedience to his father. I, That's right. But his purpose was that I might be his own. Mm -hmm. That I might live under him. He's Lord, and I'm not. And I live under him, and you do too, in his kingdom, and we serve him. Not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness that he has awarded to us in innocence and blessedness. So that's, that's our goal. Our, that's where we're going. Even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns. Meditate on this. It's all from scripture. There's nothing in here that does not derive from the Bible. Right. And I put it in here, not because uh, we're studying creeds, we're studying the person and work of Christ. Mm -hmm. I love this. Uh, uh, Martin Luther in 1529 had only one purpose here, and that was to teach the church, all the members of the church, the, the old people and the middle-aged people and the children what the scriptures say about Jesus. 
And he taught them this because he loved them. Comments, questions, applications. I did not start my timer. I believe we're about 40 minutes in. Shall we go on? Yes. We have a lot to do, people. I think it's always ironic, too, as you look in different parts of the Bible, how one, um, how one um, verifies the other. I mean, you know, right. uh, the cross referencing, um, it just holds so true. There's just, it's really hard to, to um, disclaim it for the most part because it, it does hold true in the different uh, Gospels. It all holds together. That's you know why. Mm -hmm. There's only one a, author. That's <laughs> what. If, what if seven people wrote a mystery? Uh, well, yeah. well, there were different, there were different authors, but they were all inspired, like you said, by the by the one author. Yes, yeah. that's my point, isn't it? Yes. Capital all, E. Yeah, it all comes together uh, in the same format for the most part, or meaning. Yes, it does. You have to work at it sometimes. Right. Let me go on. Thank you for your comments and interrupt me anytime because I'm not on a schedule to complete this by any certain date. But I love what you, you people said last week that this fits together with our Advent mm -hmm. and pre-Christmas uh, study. Yes. So here is the Christmas event. Funny I should mention that. And the word became flesh. Now this word, word, W-O-R-D, is a translation of a Greek word which cannot be easily explained. It's a, it's a concept. L-O-G-O-S. Logos. Logos? L-O-G-O-S. That's the Greek word which, which is translated word. The pre-incarnate Christ. You don't like that phrase, do you? The Jesus before he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Christ is eternal with the Father and the Spirit. Can't explain that. But John confesses it in his gospel, the first chapter. The mm -hmm. word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The word in the Greek is, is tabernacle. <laughs> you remember in the Old Testament how uh, God dwelt with his people in the tabernacle? Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. That's true. I remember well, that. he, the word became flesh and he set up his tent among us. One of the paraphrasers of the New Testament by the name of Peterson said uh, that that he came to our neighborhood. <laughs> now that's not a translation, but it kind of helps us see that Jesus Christ came to the people just as they were in all their joys and in all their sorrows. He suddenly appeared in rather humble fashion, uh, known only to a few people, angels and some people who came from, and some men who came from the East to bring him gifts. Well, he, he did that. And that was God's design. Now, I have a picture of the cross there to indicate why he became flesh and dwelt among us. He became flesh so that he could live with us and fulfill the law of God for us. And so he could die. And he put on flesh. And, and John says, we've seen his glory. How in the world did John and the other apostles see the glory of Jesus? That's a serious question. Uh, I'm interested in your answers. How did they see his glory? <laughs> Especially when he rose uh, uh, from the dead from the dead and and uh, wrote, uh, and ascended into heaven that was a glorious event and three of them saw his glory when on the mount 
of transfiguration. Right. You were going to say that, huh? Transfiguration. Why else did they see his glory? What did we study before we got into this part of the person and work of Christ? What were we studying? I sent you a list. No. <laughs> what did I send oh. you a list of? A couple weeks ago. 37 what? Oh, that's the, oh, the miracles. The miracles. The miracles. They saw his glory revealed in each one of the miracles. Well, they weren't always aware of it. And it, the glory belonged to him that came to him because he was the only son, the only begotten son of the father. And he's full of grace and truth. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. A very important verse in the Bible. How did these truths about Jesus come to be written? Well, I think you know. That eyewitnesses saw and they heard and they knew and they believed and they confessed and they wrote it down. Thank you. Thank you, John, Peter, Mark. Thank you, Matthew. Make a list. Make a list of the people who wrote it down. They saw and they heard. They wrote. And the Holy Spirit inspired their writings so that we know that they got it right. And Jesus Christ himself promised it. I, I love it when he says that they wouldn't have to take notes. No, he didn't say that. He said, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all that I have taught you. Mm. Wow. You didn't have to have tape recordings. Take notes that the Holy Spirit will bring to your minds. Well, that's a great promise because it tells us that what they wrote down was absolutely true. Hmm. Otherwise they would be saying things like, well, I think I've got this right, but I can't be sure. <laughs> well, who would believe it then? No one. That's very important. The source of what we believe about Jesus Christ. Now, we are getting close to the end of uh, about an hour. And because I failed to hit the, the timer on my phone, I don't know. Uh, I know we were getting ready about quarter after the hour. And we're at about 45, 47, 48 minutes now. Are we? So I'm hesitant to jump into this. Let's see where we get for a couple of minutes. Jesus Christ, true God and true man. You remember this, Ben, back here? This, this one here. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. All right? True God, begotten of the Father, and also true man born of the Virgin Mary as my Lord. So that's where we are in the person of work and work of Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And you've seen this before, that we're talking about the person, who he is, and the works of Jesus, what he did, including what he said. So the first thing to study under this topic is the deity of Jesus Christ. And what do I mean by his deity? Crowning glory? No, that's yeah. not quite right. What's the deity of Jesus? The godliness. The fact that he is true God, yes. And the humanity. We have a mystery here. Remember, St. Paul said that he was a steward of the mysteries of God. Right. They weren't his. 
but he took care to teach them correctly. That's what he meant by being a steward of the mystery of God, plural, mysteries. And one of the mysteries that you and I can't figure out and never will is that in Jesus Christ, we have this God-man. Yeah. He is true God, and he is true man, and he's not separated. He's not two persons. He's one person. Three and one. This is two in one, not the three in one of the Trinity, but the two in one of Jesus Christ, God and man in one person. Okay. Now, in the first few centuries of the history of the Christian church, you have seven or eight false teachings regarding the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. I am not going to go into all of those. These people have difficult names and difficult histories. If you want to study them, you can find that on the internet, or you can find many, many books about this. But I said, mm -hmm. that's not necessary for us to teach the truth. I was taught long ago, in order to teach the truth and distinguish it from the errors that people have believed and taught over the 20 centuries, that the best way to, to show you the truth is to shine light on the truth so that you don't have to talk about all the errors. We did it in seminary, and you can still do that. But what I'm trying to say that is when you are a clerk in Publix, hello, Sally. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. not able to do that anymore. But when you're a clerk in a store, they do not bring out eight or 10 uh, fake $100 bills. They, they could not conceive of all the ways to show you counterfeit bills. What they do is bring out the true $100 bill. That way, if you see a a hundred dollar bill that deviates from that true one hundred dollar bill, you will know a counterfeit right off that that color doesn't belong in that part of the bill. That's how you distinguish it. Well, this is how we teach the truth about Jesus Christ. We teach what the scriptures say. And then if someone says something that's not that, you distinguish that error from what you have been taught in the Holy Scriptures. You got that idea? Okay. When we, when we talk about the deity and the humanity of Christ, we'll shine the light on the truth, and we won't try to explain what we don't understand. That's when you get into errors. When you try to explain the unexplainable, what God has not revealed. Now, maybe I'm going into too much detail, but you know, if you study the, the false denominations, you will raise an eyebrow, I hope, to mm -hmm. some of their teachings. And I don't want you to be led into error by someone who comes to your door and wants to give you a leaflet. <laughs> okay? Yeah. The mother-in-law used to give them a dime. <laughs> when they gave her a leaflet, she'd accept it, but she'd always give them a dime. And one time she didn't have a dime. She went to the door in a hurry. We were there. And Ginny and I laughed about it for a long time. <laughs> she gave him a penny. <laughs> and they, and the, the man put it in his hand and he looked down at it. And he said, okay. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> it was well maybe only funny to us the deity of jesus christ is something that we're going to uh, look into in the next lesson the next time together and now i think it's best that we bring this time to a close i've gone on several tangents i hope they were useful to you if not bring them up next week <laughs> next time if you will and we'll talk about them do you have any closing comments about this huge and wonderful and glorious study of jesus 
Pastor, I'm sorry, I couldn't be here for the entire time, but I enjoyed it. I remember the Apostles' Creed um, being always implemental or being helpful whenever we have a baptism where we have to uh, acknowledge. Uh, I don't know if you discussed this. Um, and and I, I did a little research saying that the Apostles' Creed, I guess, is every regular service. I, I remember as a kid playing tic-tac-toe during the sermons, <laughs> um, the Nicene Creed was always used for communion Sunday, so we had a little extra time um, to play our tic-tac-toe. But, you know, the funny thing is you're playing tic-tac-toe and the, the words are still going there. And I really appreciate the creeds from the opportunity of, of uh, a week, weekly reaffirming our faith and I noticed at the Advent service, uh, Pastor Vince, this past Wednesday, uh, when we sort of had like a joint service with the other uh, other church, it, it gave them an opportunity to hear what we uh, recite weekly. And I, I like that about a traditional service. The the yeah. newer services, they don't it's it seems like the same old thing but you don't you don't say the same words all the time every week which you say in a creed correct i'm going to bring this session to a close with a prayer and i thank you for your active and eager participation lord god you have made known to us this mystery of your son coming in human flesh to be our savior we cannot sufficiently thank you that you have revealed him to us that we might believe on him and be saved through his death and resurrection and his promise of coming together to bring all of the members of your church together in one glorious day. Until then, help us to believe on him who was made flesh as we celebrate the mystery that you have revealed here. Teach us what the creed means to our hearts and to our lives that we might follow him who is Lord as well as Savior. We pray in the name which has been confessed for centuries, Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.